In my World War I and Interwar series, I have uploaded several videos on both China and Japan, explaining how China was partially reunited after several revolutions, but also how Japan viewed its much larger but relatively weak neighbor. It's time to talk about the Second Sino-Japanese War, which eventually merged with the much larger global conflict and developed into the bloodiest Pacific War ever recorded. As I mentioned before, Japan had been eyeing Chinese territory for decades, starting its territorial expansion not long after the Meiji Restoration. Its rapid industrial development allowed the island nation to modernize its army and navy, which then defeated China in 1895 and then Russia in 1905. Japan transformed itself into a major regional power with increasing ambitions and fervent nationalism. This led to the 21 demands during World War I, which would have rendered China a Japanese puppet state, then a series of incidents during China's warlord era. Tensions culminated in the 1931 invasion of Manchuria, during which Japanese forces occupied the region, installed the last emperor of China, Pu Yi, as a puppet ruler, and started the exploitation of the local resources, industrial capacity, and manpower. Relations between Tokyo and Nanjing remained tenuous, although the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek tried to avoid direct confrontation, focusing on its civil war against the communists instead. However, more clashes with the Japanese occurred after the 1928 Jinan incident, for example in Shanghai in 1932 and up north in the Great Wall region a year later. In both cases, a demilitarized buffer zone was created, which Chinese forces could not enter anymore, while local collaborators ensured Japanese authority in the area. Through several treaties, the Kuomintang was pushed out of northern China, it had to abandon several provinces, so eventually Beijing itself became a border zone threatened by the Japanese expansion. In July 1937, another incident took place, this time at the Marco Polo Bridge on the road leading to Beijing. Clashes continued in the following days, with more provocation by the Japanese, after which the leader of the Ma clique ensured the Chinese government that he was ready to support them, which he proved by sending his first cavalry division to the area. The Japanese government in Tokyo attempted to defuse the situation, but the army's high command sent more troops to the region, even though some generals were also against further escalation. After some delays, more reinforcements arrived, and by the end of the month, more clashes followed at the city of Langfang and the outskirts of Beijing. The Japanese demanded that General Song Jiayuan's Chinese 29th Army withdraw and abandon the city of Beijing. This was refused, and even though the requested large reinforcements were not available, General Song prepared for battle. Chiang Kai-shek, who had been avoiding open conflict with Japan for years, now announced a new policy of national resistance. On the 27th of July, Tongzhou was besieged, while Japanese 20th Division attacked several districts in Beijing with close air support, pushing back Chinese 132nd Division in bitter fighting. At the same time, Chinese 38th Division regained some territory at Langfang, but by the following day, 29th Army had to retreat. Interestingly, some 5,000 Chinese collaborationist troops on the Japanese side mutinied and massacred the Japanese garrison and Japanese civilians in Tongzhou, but the only result was that public sentiment in Japan changed as support for a full-scale war increased all around the nation. Their next attack was directed against Tianjin, Beijing's port city. Chinese forces put up stiff resistance, but after two days they had to retreat once again, leaving the city to the Japanese. 
Beijing followed on the 8th of August, when the remaining Chinese troops withdrew to Chahar province. A Japanese military parade was held there 10 days later, announcing a new military governor, but more importantly, northern China was now defenseless, as the remaining NRA forces would continue to retreat from the much stronger and better organized Japanese divisions. This continued until the spring of 1938, when another major battle was fought to stop the Japanese advance. Even though the war began near Beijing, and the Northern Front was in the focus, a month later, in early August, Chiang deployed his best troops to Shanghai. The city had an international settlement, with many European and American civilians, along with their small military contingents, but also a Japanese quarter, the elimination of which became the main Chinese target. This would take place without touching the international settlement and avoiding a diplomatic backlash from Western powers. Naturally, Japan viewed this as a direct violation of the previous treaty, which forbade the stationing of Chinese troops within Shanghai, but when they demanded the complete withdrawal of Chinese forces, the answer was a direct assault. Chinese troops launched an attack on the Japanese district and nearby Japanese Navy vessels with the support of their Air Force, which had both Chinese and American pilots. The National Revolutionary Army, the NRA, had 70,000 men in five divisions in the area, subordinated to 5th Army. They faced only 6,000 Japanese Marines but when they attacked on August 14, strong support from the Japanese Navy and Air Force prevented a victory. Chinese heavy weapons were ineffective against concrete bunkers, not to mention that their infantry did not cooperate well with the few tanks they had, so their attack ground to a halt. Japanese tanks were more successful in their counterattack, they pushed back the Chinese units. The Chinese Air Force shot down 85 Japanese planes but lost 91 in the process, roughly half of its force. It was running out of trained pilots and American-made fighters like the Curtis Hawks. Domestic production was low, there were no spare parts, which meant that such losses could not be sustained for long. On the 22nd of August, three Japanese divisions landed 50 kilometers northeast from Shanghai, so Chinese troops had to be redeployed, lengthening the front line. Their attack within the city stopped, the battle deteriorated into a stalemate, but the second phase soon began, with four more Japanese divisions and various smaller units being redirected to this area. Chinese 18th Army tried to prevent the landings, but strong naval and aerial bombardment made this impossible, although they managed to hold on to several coastal towns against all odds, taking them back several times. Eventually, more than 200,000 Japanese troops were committed, with strong air and naval support, including aircraft carriers and medium bombers. 500 Japanese planes fought against 180 Chinese, they also had 300 tanks, while the NRA had only 40, and Chinese losses could not be replaced due to the small size and underdeveloped state of the Chinese arms industry. In early September, the vital town of Baoshan fell after being completely destroyed, along with an entire Chinese battalion. The next step was the defense of Luodian, where 300,000 Chinese tried to stop 100,000 Japanese. Despite stubborn resistance, Japanese firepower resulted in a 50% loss on the Chinese side, so by the end of September, retreat was ordered. Throughout October, another battle raged for the control of Dachang, and even though the Guangxi army finally arrived, superior firepower once again led to enormous casualties and the eventual retreat. After this, Shanghai itself had to be given up, although one battalion of the 88th Division was ordered to stay there and continue fighting, as Chiang hoped this would turn public opinion against the Japanese and may even lead to foreign intervention. By that time, the huge losses suffered meant 
that 8 to 12 Chinese divisions were needed to match the strength of a single Japanese division. The best Chinese units were wiped out in a battle of attrition, but losses were significant on both sides, which frustrated the Japanese, who had expected a quick victory. We'll see in the next episode what this frustration led to. Thank you for watching. See you next time.